Welcome to the latest episode of Doorstep History coming once again from the Coffin Works in Birmingham's Jewelry Quarter. Yes, we've got all the bees today. We've got Beach, Baggies and Bolter. Mmm, Beach of the Baggies. The name Harold Beach may not resonate with many people, but he was a famous player in the pre-war days. He was destined to become the George Best or the Duncan Edwards of his day. But unfortunately, he met his death on the killing fields of Flanders, exactly 100 years ago this month. Over the years, West Bromwich Albion have had many heroes. You think of Siddle Regis, Jeff Astle, Ronnie Allen, and people like that. But also, in the Great Hall of Fame, was this man, Harold Bache. You may never have heard of him, because he only played 14 times for West Bromwich Albion. But he was destined to be the George Best, or the Duncan Edwards, of his day. Unfortunately, he was killed in action in the First World War, exactly a hundred years ago this week. I'm in the Worcestershire village of Churchill, where Bache was born in April 1889, and he's remembered here on the War Memorial in the centre of the village. So Harold played 14 times for West Bromwich Albion, that's all. And he was also an amateur, wasn't he, Simon? So why did people think he was going to be such a success? I think because he was an outstanding footballer. Um, it's hard to make comparisons with modern day players, but if you like, perhaps um, Silver of Manchester City. Small, very quick, very intelligent, very unselfish, if I can use that word. He was ha far happier setting up goals for other people rather than scoring them himself. And, you know, he was just a clever, clever player who could spot a pass far better than anybody around him. Beach is remembered at his former school, King Edwards in Edgbaston. Currently there is a fantastic World War I exhibition and Beach takes pride of place. Harold Beach was admitted to King Edward School in 1898 and left in 1908. So he was here for 10 years, which was quite a long time. And we have lots of records in our archive um, telling us the story of Harold Beach's school days. Um, I think we all know that he was uh, an excellent and very talented uh, sportsman and our records confirm that. We know that he played uh, rugby to a very high standard, he was an athlete, an all-round athlete, he played fives and cricket and of course we know that he later went on to represent uh, the county at cricket and played for West Bromwich Albion uh, on the football field. But we also know that he was uh, very well respected by his peers. He was, I think, what we would call an all-round good egg. He was a boy of great character, the school magazines tell us. So he was uh, a real gentleman, is what we're, uh, the records lead us to believe. And this is him pictured here, isn't it? The... This is him, yes. This is him, uh, not at school. Sadly, we don't have any photographs of Beach as a schoolboy, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, but we do have lots of records uh, telling us a little about his character. And in fact, we even have a copy of a letter in the Old Edwardians Gazette, which is the old boys magazine from 1976, which tells us um, that he was really, really highly thought of um, at school. When Harold left school in uh, 1908, he went up to Cambridge where he was captain of the cricket and football teams and of course at Cambridge Blue, so his sporting career continued uh, long after uh, his time at King Edward's school. And there was a comparison made earlier with Duncan Edwards and I think that is such an amazing, valid comparison because, you know, obviously World War I wasn't his fault. You know, if he'd have been born in a different era, he would have been amazing. He would have been an amazing player, you know. Um, he only got to play 14 games at that level, but given the fact he was an astonishing all-round sportsman and who's successful in just about everything he tried, 
got absolutely no doubt he would have, you know, he would have had an England cap or several England cups. Um, I mean, here's one thought for you. If he'd, if he'd have, you know, survived the war and been part of the West Bromwich Albion team that won the championship, just think, you know, how much longer they could have carried on with a player like him up front to, you know, to score goals, set up chances, etc, etc. You know, whereas it was a one-season wonder, sadly, for that team. He made his debut in February 1914 at Villa Park in the FA Cup. The local press commenting that he brightened up the Albion attack considerably and he possessed the happy knack of getting the best out of his forward colleagues. The Sports Argus reports always made interesting reading. It was reported that the amateur was fast and tricky and occasioned much trouble to United by his speed and subtlety of movement. Later he scored against the Villa in a 3-2 win in the final of the Lord Mayor of Birmingham's Charity Cup. HG immediately caught the eye, the press commenting that a feature of the game was the brilliant play of Harold Beach and his control of the ball was wonderful. Later that month, the press reported that Harold had joined the forces. It was noted that supporters are patriotic and HG will have the best wishes of all Midland sportsmen. He trained with the Lincolnshire Regiment in Grimsby, but moved back home to help with recruitment in Staffordshire, prompting the press to note that his new position will enable him to maintain his connection with the Albion. This is the best bit of news heard in a day in Throsseldom. In January 1916, at Middlesbrough, he scored the only goal of the game in what was to be his last league appearance for the club. The Sports Argus said it was an awesome performance from Beach, Albion's military centre-forward. The Athletic News reported, whilst running at right angles to the posts, Beach suddenly checked the ball and shot with electrifying vigour into the net. It was one of the most brilliantly taken goals that this writer has ever seen, and the occupants of the stand sprang from their seats and gave the military footballer an ovation. Harold Bates became a grenade officer in charge of bomb throwers in the Lancashire Fusiliers, better known as the Suicide Squad. He was lucky to survive for as long as he did. His death was announced in February 1916. A finer sportsman, better soldier and a nicer gentleman it would be impossible to find. The athletic world has lost a notable and conspicuous figure. All Midland sportsmen will regret to hear the sad news concerning a popular member of a family which had been associated with West Bromwich for a long period. He lived a glorious life. He died a glorious death. He died fighting for England. He died for the cause of justice and righteousness. Harold's body was never recovered, and his name is one of over 50,000 mentioned on the Menim Gate Memorial at Ypres in Belgium. He is remembered at the Hawthorns on the First World War Memorial, and also a blue plaque was unveiled in November 2014. Today we honour his memory with a plaque to be unveiled pitch side. He's also remembered at his old school. In 1919, so three years after Harold's death, his brother John, who was also an old Edwardian, set up the Beach Memorial Fund. And that fund paid for a permanent memorial to his brother in the school and a silver cup, which is awarded every year to this day to the best sportsman at King Edward's School. The Beach Memorial Award is one of the uh, big things that matters in the school. If you come in through the main part of the school, there's an honours board which has got the chief masters on it. It's got an honours board with the heads of school on it. And next door to that are the winners of the Beach Memorial. Um, and so therefore each year the boy who wins the Beach Memorial, he uh, gets his cup and he gets up on stage in uh, speech day. And uh, it really does matter to those kids. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. So, and, People remember, um, I can remember, I was a boy here myself and I didn't win the beach. I was robbed, I thought. Um, but um, 
the boys who won it certainly remember it, and um, I have one or two friends who deserve to win it and didn't win it, who um, it still um, <laughs> troubles them to this day. Quite what happened to Bait is open to much conjecture, so we'll probably be looking at that in a later programme. After the break, we'll be looking at the story of Birmingham's signature dish, going for a ball tea and making a meal of it. Mm, looking forward to that. Me too. Welcome back to Doorstep History, filmed right here from the Coffin Works in Birmingham's Jewellery Quarter. Now we're going to go and join Norman on the Lady Paul Road where he's with Andy Munro discussing the history of the Birmingham Balti. I'm told the best place to come for the Balti is Adil's here on Stony Lane. And there's a very good reason why people say that. Let's go and find out. Right, so I'm here with uh, Andy and Arif. Let's start with you, Arif, first. So this is your restaurant. So started on 77. And uh, I started the Balti, 1977. Got the idea from uh, Pakistan. First Balti in the UK, you know, I started. Well, like most people, uh, I used to go out for curry in the 60s, early 70s, and it was a typical flock wallpaper, sitar music in the background, rice on silver platters, nice tablecloths, very, a very formal uh, affair really, and it was really the province of uh, groups of lads going for the hottest curry they could uh, manage, or maybe a couple on a romantic night out. And that was it, but Balti completely changed things, it became a family thing particularly because it, because it's informality everybody uses a naan bread rather than rice usually and the places aren't licensed you can bring your own uh, alcohol uh, but they're not licensed it was the whole thing was far more informal than your, your typical curry so people felt more comfortable bringing their families and I'd say Balti's tend to be there are some places open late at night but most they probably their main custom is typically family orientated between 7 and about 10 o'clock so going for a balti, as people say these days, is obviously a very popular thing. Lots of people come to Birmingham and have heard of the balti triangle. And they could go anywhere in Birmingham, have a curry and think they're having a balti. But it's not the real Makaya. Absolutely. Really, is it? No, and that's why we're going for European mark. Uh, we were a bit concerned that basically, you know, you can go anywhere now and have, in quotes, a balti. You can have a balti pie at halftime at a football match. Yeah. You can go to a supermarket and have a, a, a balti chicken for their cold display. But that's not a real balti. So I got together a group of restaurants, which of course includes Adil, uh, and we decided to go for a Birmingham balti European trademark. The reason we're going for Birmingham Balti is because Balti has now become a generic term for any sort of curry uh, and so we want to try and safeguard this under what's called a TSG which is Traditional Speciality Guaranteed. We started going for it in 2009. Amazingly now we're six years on, well over six years on, and people have actually died going for these marks, so we're, we're, we're still hoping for the best. So is that something like Malta Mowbray has got its pork pie, Bakewell's got its tart, uh, Cornwall's got its pasty, so Birmingham's going to have its balti mark. That's absolutely right. In fact, the guy who got the mark for the Melt Mowbray pork pies, who lives in Leicestershire, he actually gave me some early advice, which is very helpful. Uh, uh, so, yes, it's that, and really it's all about having to show that the, it's prepared in a certain way. Now, the difference between uh, a Birmingham balti and if you like a curry, it's fairly straightforward. First of all, the bowl that um, Arif had designed, um, where it's cooked on a high flame and served up in the same bowl, retaining the flavours, that's absolutely paramount importance. So it's got to be the same bowl. So if you get a balti served up in a silver, little be beautiful shining silver bowl, it's not a balti, not a Birmingham balti, okay? Um, Mm -hmm. And then also, it's got to be done in vegetable or not ghee, 
Mm. Most pe people use ghee if you go to a takeaway, you know, and, and have, a, have a, a curry. You'll find it's quite a cloying, heavy taste. A bolt is a lot lighter taste, and it's done, that's because it's done in vegetable oil. Then during the fast cooking process, uh, you get obviously things like ginger and garlic and cumin and turmeric, garam masala. All these things are thrown in during the fast cooking process. Every restaurant uses a restaurant sauce as well which isn't a problem. They all slightly differ, which is great, which means the Balti, all the different Baltis and different restaurants taste slightly different, albeit having a lighter taste because of the way they're cooked. In terms of when people come to Birmingham and yeah. they've heard all about the Balti and we've been in the New York Times, you name it, yeah. they get the real thing. Real and I think it'll bring more people into yeah. Birmingham yeah, to try the real thing yeah, as well. Good. Now we've come down to Ladypool Road, which anybody that knows this area will know Ladypool Road, quite a famous road in Birmingham. And the shop behind us is Raja Brothers and Mr. Raja himself, the, the main man, has been here for what, over 40 years? No, almost, yes. yes. Yeah. Since 1977 we are on Ladypool Road and it's our fourth generation here. And we start a business for here, as I said to you early on, and we're hoping to finish from here as well. And we enjoy it, we like it, and one of the best road area, and all mixed community here, um, ethnic backgrounds, all over the world, you know. Mm -hmm. And you can buy from here anything and everything, whatever you want, even from Middle East, West Indies, Pakistan, India. If you think something, you can come, come to Lady Road, you can buy it. So it's obviously changed a lot since 1977. Of course, it's changed lots of them. It's, it's, uh, it's food-wise, fashion-wise, the lady fashion ways. Lots of big shop you have seen is beautiful here. And people come all, even Edinburgh, Glasgow, Scotland, people come buy, you know, wedding stuff, uh, wedding jewelry, wedding clothes, um, lots of our wedding shoes from here. So it's a very famous road and very stable and established road and we are as a community work together. This bucket here, yeah. Balti mean bucket yeah. And they use that at weddings for, for yeah. food, yeah? For food, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. So basically then Balti means bucket. Bucket, yeah, but uh, actually you know... It doesn't sound quite come. so romantic and nice does it when you say it's a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter when you taste it. <laughs> Talking of tasting, I think it's about time we did some tasting. Oh, I think it'll be very good. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> So a, a reef uh, runs place, but it's called Adil. So a lot of people will think Adil is is his name, isn't it? But that's not the case, is it? No, a reef is the owner, but um, he named the restaurant after well, Adil actually means justice, the scales of justice, and that used to be their logo years ago. Oh right, yeah. And in fact, it's also named his son. So that's where it all comes from. Uh, right. So he's actually named the, with the word the local dialect for justice. Yeah. And his son is also called a deal. Exactly, oh, right. so there's a bit of family history behind yeah. that as well. Yeah. Mm. Very nice. The naan bread's nice, the naan bread's nice. So what got you interested in Balti in the first place? Well, I was born and bred in the area. Um, in the 1950s, and I was fed a diet of lamb chops and boiled potatoes by my parents who'd been in the war. They all thought curry was to do with um, dodgy food basically, so I was never allowed to have curry at home. <laughs> well, funny enough, I found out years later my mum uh, worked in Virshwamis in the 1920s, which is the first ever Indian restaurant in London. <laughs> uh, I like to think curry's in the jeans somewhere, but, yeah. uh, but no, I mean, I used to go for a, a curry with the lads and have a vindaloo or something and could you brave it out with a t two jugs of water yeah. uh, but the first time I had a bolt it was like almost like an epiph a culinary epiphany or a curry epiphany I suppose <laughs> so yeah. yeah and so much so you've actually written a book haven't you the d definitive guide to the Balti in well, Birmingham I think it's become part of Birmingham social history and I mean it, at its peak in the 90s, I think instead of asking about the weather, people would say, where are you going for a Balti? Mm -hmm. That's what I call the book, going for a Balti, because that was yeah. like the phrase everybody used. Mm -hmm. And I've just felt it needed to be recorded without sounding pompous. It's really a bit of social history of Birmingham, the mm -hmm. Balti.
everything you need to know about a bolt to that and probably there were lots more that you really didn't want to know <laughs> but there, there we go and unfortunately that's about it for this program unfortunately but next week we've got a special program haven't we i'm not going to be here i'm going to leave it to you two so what's it all about well we've been out on location haven't we yeah. in birmingham looking at That's birmingham's medieval heritage mm -hmm. it has got us out and we're going back specifically to 1166 and looking at wow. why that is such a key date in birmingham's history yeah and we've also got a very special guest as well nearly forgot yes we have but uh we're not going to tell you too much about that we're going to leave that for you to find out next week well, so mm. talking about next week, how can people get in touch with us then in the meantime? Yes, yeah, so if you've got any local history stories that you want to share, then don't hesitate to get in contact with us. You can get in contact with us on Twitter at Big Centre TV, or you can get in contact with us via email hello at Big TV. So that's it for this edition of Doorstep History. So goodbye and thanks for watching. Yeah. yeah.